Hey, this is Avante. I'm Eli, and this is hosted by Posh. An intimate series where we talk with the most influential people in the event space and hear about the movements they've built. All right, we're joined by West End, internationally renowned touring DJ, and also the leader of Kick and Bass, one of the largest producer communities right now. Um, let's start from the beginning. You have a kind of unconventional come up story. You didn't go right into the, the disc jockey scene. You, you started off with at Duke University, right? And then you went into a more normal job. You wanna I, I didn't start about? off at Duke University. I started off in high school and middle <laughs> school and elementary school. But uh, yeah, I've been, DJing for a very long time, well, not a very long time, but almost a third of my life. So I started in high school and then I've kind of kept DJing and producing um, through high school, through college, through working after college, and now I do it. That's all I do. So why'd you start in high school? Yes, yeah, so I started because uh, I fell in love with electronic music. Um, a friend of mine showed me Justice. Uh, I don't know. If People, they've kind of been on like a hiatus for a little bit, but um, I listened to their album Cross mm -hmm. and I was like, this is the coolest shit ever. Um, so, sorry, can I curse? My bad, I kind of stopped myself yeah. there. Um, I'm just gonna restart with what I said there. So yeah, I fell in love with Justice and their album Cross and I was like, okay, electronic music's like the coolest thing ever. Um, and at my high school, we actually had a digital music lab. So I went to high school with the guy, with this guy, Robert Moog, who uh, invented the Moog synthesizer, which oh, is kind yeah. of like what you need to make electronic music. And he, he was in high school at the same time? No, 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 no. He's like 50 years old. Oh, the like same that. High he went to the same high school as me. And so there was like a digital music lab there that was donated by his daughter and it had like 30 computers, um, all with like MIDI keyboards and this program called Reason on, Reason on it, which is a, a DAW. And that's kind of how I got started. I took that class and I was like, okay, I really like electronic music. I kind of want to get into it. I had a buddy at the time that was also a DJ and we would throw like these parties all around New York. Um, They're called track parties because like the track team would like put up all the money in front of it. But throwing parties as a high schooler in New York is like very interesting because there's like no space to really have a party. Yeah. Like you can't have like a rave in an apartment. It just like the neighbors will call the police in 10 seconds. So we would rent out these like little spaces all around Manhattan. Like there was a community center like uh, you know, on 6th Street that we would go to and we would like someone would give the guy a fake ID and we would be like, oh, we're college kid students throwing a party. And um, that's kind of where I got into DJing was like DJing some of these like little raves for like all these high school kids um, while well, I was in high school and I was like, this is the dopest shit ever. Just like that's that dope, feeling man. of playing music for people. I, I got very addicted to that very quickly and I was like, I want more of this. And so I kind of, well, that's how I got started. Sound? So the initial sound at the time was like Electra House, almost like Blog House is what they call it. Like uh, Crookers, like think of, um, oh, what's that movie about those guys throw the crazy party? Uh, Project X? Project X. Yeah. So like Steve, Pursuit of Happiness, Steve Aoki remix, like uh, that kind of- And you were playing your own shit from the get-go or you no, had to- No, no, no. So like originally a little bit like, so I would like test one of the songs, like I would make it and throw it in there and it would sound like shit compared to everything else. But yeah, it was a lot of like Electra House, Progressive House, like Alesso, Avicii, like old 2011, 2012 stuff. Um, Dutch House was really big. Yeah. Guys like Afrojack, Chucky, Moombaton a little bit, a little bit later, but That's that was kind of the sound that I got into it. It's dope that you touched the DAW before DJing though, and kind of that was your first step into it. Cause I think a lot of people just want to be a DJ, especially now, yeah. just like they just want to, you know, get an RX2 or something and just yeah. sit around. It's, for me, it was like the same time. So I kind of got into making beats at the same time as DJing. I think that was like helpful because um, like you said, like a lot of people are, it's very easy to DJ, um, in my opinion. To be good at it is one thing, but just to learn how to mix two songs together is not difficult. And so, um, but making music is extremely difficult to make it at like a high level. And so, 
a lot of people these days, it's like, oh, you maybe start DJing your after parties and you know your friend's basement and stuff. Um, and then like, you want to become a producer, and it's like you got to put years and years yeah. into that. Um, what so were you yeah. going by then? Was it still West End? No, it was DJ Tyler Morris originally. And then I was in a duo with a, a buddy of mine from high school. We were Fight Club. We are like one of the Vals. I forgot which one. It was like some, you know, like the Dead Mouse is a, what is it, eight? No. There's another Fight Club with the yes, U Yes, that was the v. problem. We had to change our name because, yeah, Fight Club with a V. Maybe we didn't have that. But we were Fight Club, and then we were C&T, Che and Tyler. So West End didn't really start until 2016, actually. And what, um, where is that from? So West End comes from the avenue I grew up on in Manhattan. There's West End Avenue. Um, so it sounds very. I feel like the British drill rappers always say, "I'm from the yeah, ends." You know, <laughs> it gets. It's like I love the name, but it's like a terrible name for SEO because, like, anytime you search in West West End, you just get like the local neighborhood that's called like West End. Like, there's like a West End DJ shop in London. So every time you type in West End DJ, you get like this. Google Maps listing, so it's not a great SEO. Name, in, in that vein, how do you, you have your own sound, but outside of producing, like how from the beginning do you separate yourself as a brand? Like what makes you different than everyone else that's in this New York electro crowd? Well, at the time there was no like, I need to differentiate myself because I wasn't even thinking about anything like that. Um, and I kind of went off to college, like right, you know, I only kind of, I got into DJing the last two years of high school like end of my junior year, senior year. And then I was like, okay, I'm going to North Carolina for four years. Um, so I wasn't really thinking like New York locally at the time. It was more of like, you know, we would compete against the other DJs in our high school to like who would play this party, who would do the opening slot, who would do whatever, like, you know, the main slot. And you um, promote to see who could get it or? Yeah, th there was a lot of that going on. Like uh, there's a, there used to be a club called Pasha uh, in meatpacking and they would do these under 18 parties, which now that I think about it is like a terrible idea, but it's essentially <laughs> like, let's get like, you have to be under 16 to get into the club and it's like this teenage night. So under 16. Yeah, I mean, that's, you could not be older than 16 to get in and you had to, yeah, you know, you had to be like under 18 or something like that. Yeah. Um, and they would book like, they book like Martin Garrix, like Zed, wow. like sick headliner. So it was actually amazing because if you, you're not 21, you're not 18 at the time, you can't like go see these DJs cause, unless you have like a fake ID. So it was, it was a good opportunity to actually be able to like experience electronic music live yeah. before you were 18. But yeah, I think I did like some slots there where you like, you have to sell 50 tickets to get this kind of slot, you know? You play like a 20 um, minute set or something. Yeah, you play like a 20 <laughs> minute set in the basement and there's, you know, there's no one there, but. That's dope. Yeah, it was still a cool opportunity. What was the one, there was a production company that has Glow in it that was really big, Night Glow, you know what I'm talking about or something? And then we know uh, No ID Events was huge in New York, you heard of them? There was, so, that's the thing with the, in the electronic space is like there's so many companies Super that, saturated. Yeah, that like were here. Like there was a festival in Jones Beach called Identity Festival that Cascade would throw. I don't know if that's it, but I mean, promoters and clubs, these things like the turnaround is, so fast so there might have been but i don't know off the top of my head and so you went from the city obviously to duke you went for public policy is that right i didn't go for public policy that's like what i ended up majoring when i was there um i just like went as a liberal arts you know there's like an engineering school and then there's like a liberal arts school um and i ended up majoring in public policy because Honestly, because it was easier than economics and it was like they had like a grad school there. So like everyone, a lot of kids like did public policy. Um, that's like one of my big regrets is like not doing something more artsy related at the time. More because I, I didn't think I had the, I didn't think I would be able to DJ full time. It was like a job. Like I never really thought that was like a reality. I wasn't like this is going to happen to me. Um, so yeah, I ended up picking public, picking public policy. But I don't remember anything from public policy. It's crazy, like my brain, like I don't remember any of my classes, like anything. So I wouldn't say it was a waste, but um, yeah, none of the like technical information I really used. Were you in deep in the doll in, in college or not yet? I was definitely producing like all throughout college. I was DJing way more than I was in high school. Tons of like frat and sorority parties at Duke. But the scene at Duke is like very different than New York. It's like the South and you know, you have kids from Cool thing is you have a lot of international kids and those guys like electronic music, but you have like a lot of people. You gotta from, throw in country roads every set. Oh or my some god! Shit, the yeah. amount of times I play country roads and just like, 
it, it was good for me as a DJ though, because like that's where you really learn how to be in like a an active like club situation mm -hmm. or like nightlife situation where people are asking you for like requests yeah. and and all this stuff. But uh, yeah, it wasn't like I got to play like house music all day. When I was Did you know you'd be a full time DJ or? No, no. I feel like most people don't know that they would ever be like a full time DJ because yeah. it's just something like it's an extremely competitive space and it's something that like is usually just like a hobby or passion for people and they have to like work super hard at it for many, many years and kind of like stick with it. Like there's no guarantee at all kind of in the in the DJ producer space that, you know, you can do it to the point where like that's all you can do, all you have to do for, for money pretty much. Totally. Um, even if you are like a full-time DJ, there's no guarantee that like six months from now, you'll st people still like wanna go to your shows or your music will get streams. It's like, you know, it's something you always have to kind of like put in work versus like a degree where it's like, okay, this is like a technical degree. You can now pretty much like certified to do this job for the rest of your life. Like my girlfriend's a doctor, she can, be a doctor forever. So that's it's a like, dope duo. that's, yeah, the DJ doctor duo, but, um, she gets you the IVs after a show. And oh, she doesn't. <laughs> no. It's kind of like, it's, you're not really supposed to steal those from the hospital. Like she could and stuff, <laughs> but like, um, she's not with me at all these shows anyway. So, yeah. and I hate needles. So yeah. no, it's not good. What made you confident enough to take it full time? Yeah. So I was working at this company called Yext, um, after college, which is like a tech company. It's on, it was on 23rd street. And I had worked there for like two and a half years. I started in 2016 and I quit at the end of 2018. So yeah, a little bit over two years. Um, and it, it was a combination of like a couple things. Like I was starting to play outside of my home area, which was like New York. So I was starting to get like some bookings in Detroit, um, like one in Texas. Uh, I went to Croatia with these people for like a island party, which was sick. Didn't get paid anything, but I started like kind of getting way more confident in myself because I was like, oh, I'm like not just a guy playing a couple bar shows in New York every weekend. Like I'm actually, there are some people that want me to play outside of my state. I was like, that's pretty cool. So that was like one thing. Um, the other thing was like I was, my music was like kind of resonating with some DJs at the time. So uh, this DJ, Justin Martin, who I absolutely love and like looked up to at the time, I still do. Um, he was playing like a ton of my music and it was like a huge confidence boost because I was like, okay, like I'm kind of like getting in the scene here. Like it's kind of... What was like, your strat? Were you just putting bootlegs out on SoundCloud or did you drop people USBs? No, it was like a lot of like original music, um, stuff that I was like putting on labels, like very small labels at the time and sending people music on like SoundCloud, like messaging people. It was, you know, I wouldn't say it's easier to get a hold of DJs back then. I think it's a little bit easier now. What year is this? Yeah, for This context. is like probably 2018, 2017. Um, but yeah, so, so going back to why or how I knew I was able to kind of do music full time. And there is a caveat to this, but um, I, yeah, especially the combination of these things, I was like, okay, this would be a good time to at least try to do music full time. And I was kind of like running out of vacation days. Like I would like play a show and then like, have to take off time and it was it was just kind of like getting in the way it was like getting very annoying and i was like this would be so much better if i just was able to do this full time and so i was like okay i'm gonna quit this job and just do it full time for a year and i was living at home the, t the entire time before this so like i didn't have any rent expenses i was just kind of you know my parents would buy food and stuff i was just living at home and so i was like okay this would be like the perfect time i'm like 23 or 24 um, let me just like try this and let me just put all my effort into social media, into making a ton of music, into traveling and networking. And yeah, I just did that in 2018 and I haven't looked back since. Wow. Um, but I will say like for the two to three years after that, it wasn't like, oh, I quit my job. I'm doing music full time. Everything's great. Like yeah. I <laughs> made really poor money like the first two years because when you're a small DJ, like your fees are really small, you know? If you're only getting paid like 300 to $1,000 to go on a show and it costs, you know, 500 to fly there and $200 stay in a hotel, it's like you're, you're getting- losing money. Yeah, yeah. You're, lo you're losing money on stuff. So um, you really have to have like confidence and like push through that phase. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I'm so grateful that like I was able to live at home and kind of have that sure. safety blanket. But if I didn't have that, I just like wouldn't be able to do it because I just wouldn't have been able to afford it but 
it wasn't really until like 2021 where I was like, okay, I can do this like full, full time, um, which is super lucky and I'm super grateful for it. But before yeah, you no took the, before you took the full time leap, you were obviously playing, you said Detroit and things like that. How are you fielding those gigs? So like when you're, when you're not like really popular, it's not, people don't want to book you because you're necessarily going to like sell a lot of tickets to their party because you're not like you just don't have that pull so like you get booked on like really soft nights where it's kind of like it doesn't really matter who's DJing there's like a built-in crowd um, and the way you kind of the way I did it was that I was just very active in the community so I was like on social media you know I knew a bunch of DJs at the time I was kind of like visually always there on social media commenting on things um, connecting with artists um, connecting with a lot of like the Dirty Bird artists on the label at the time and putting music out. That's like the other big thing. A lot of people that throw parties or pr promoters, they're also DJs. Um, I've learned in like the DJ space is like almost everyone's a DJ. Like as you probably know, like people, people's managers know how to DJ, people's agents know how to DJ, like all this stuff. So if these promoters are like, oh, this guy is cool. Like I'm like, he's got the song that's going around. A lot of people are playing or I really like his music. I play it a lot. Um, when they do have those like softer nights, they're gonna, or if they don't have a big budget for an artist, they're like, oh, we want to throw a party, but we can't pay someone a couple thousand dollars to come here. Let's get this dope guy out of New York that's doing something like that. So, so they're finding you on SoundCloud and things. SoundCloud, Instagram. Wow. Yeah. You think that the scene has changed now? That's harder to do that? Yeah, I think, well, yes and no. I think. For artists now, it's easy to get very popular very quickly with the algorithms that social media have. Um, those algorithms didn't really exist. There wasn't like this explore mentality where you would only like see on your feed people that you already like follow. There was no like, let's put this content in front of other people's eyes. So in that degree, I don't think it's more difficult, but there's just so many more that it's harder to break through the noise. And I think after the pandemic, promoters don't really there's not as many people that book based on just like vibe kind of, of like, oh, I like this music. Right. Like you have to have a really strong scene and community in wherever you play to do that and like know that people are gonna come out to your show no matter what. Let, let's dig into that. So we yeah. have a lot of event organizers watching and our platform is, is centered around relationships within the nightlife live experience ecosystem, both from the point of view of an organizer and from a DJ, how do you cultivate those relationships early on? You have to, yeah, they have to be genuine relationships. Um, so you can't just like, I think especially now, if you just like hit people up on Instagram, you're just like, oh, book me. Like I've opened for this person and I'm a DJ that's done this. Like it doesn't really do anything. Um, so that, that was a big thing for me. It was like, I would actually like go and meet people. And like, luckily in New York, there's like, you know, tons of DJs and people coming through and it w even. It's I stuck up though. It's hard to approach big guys, right? It. It is to some degree, but um, you just have to be like a likable person, I guess. Yeah. You know what I mean? And 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 persistence. Like I remember, I would go to parties like where my friends would be like going dancing, and I would just be like standing, waiting near the backstage, so I could like call someone's name and try to get me back there or something like that. Like yeah. I did that so many times, and um, you you just have to like be in, in in the room and in those conversations. Like that's this kind of business, it is like a, a people's business, you know, it's a person to person, relationship business, person to person business. So um, that's like super, super important and they have to be like genuine relationships. Um, you can start it online now, but I, I think being with people in, per in, in person is, is super right. important. There's an inflection point where the DJ is chasing the promoter and then it switches over to the promoters are chasing the DJ. Yeah. Um, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the bigger performances are more like an agency is booking you and it's very like behind the scenes. <clears throat> How do you, uh, independent organizers that want to have you at a local after party or a smaller show, what's their best shot at attracting like a bigger DJ like yourself that's more established? My, my agent's going to hate me for saying this, but <laughs> the, the way most, and I get this all the time still, is like, you know, people are like, oh, you're coming to play this festival, you're going to go play this show, like, you know, we want to do an after party or whatever. Um, I usually just like direct them to the agent because anytime there's money involved with anything, like that's, yeah. you know, that's the person I deal with it. Contractually. But, yeah, uh, <laughs> contractually. But yeah, I would say it's um, 
just like messaging people like that's kind of unless you know them or stuff, there's got to be like, a specific thing that stands out in the messages though no because you're also if you have a radius clause at a big show and you're doing something more underground after like is there something that really would get you hyped a show that brings you back to your money. duke days money. Or like, just money. Money. Yeah. Uh, i mean it's, it's a com if i'm being totally honest it's a combination of things right like if it's a super dope event and yeah. that can speak for itself and there's no you know trying to sell the event then then it speaks for itself send some videos of how sick it is and it's gonna be vibe if i don't have an early fight tomorrow like i'll, I'll you know i could be down but Word. It, it's all like a very situational kind of thing gotcha i get this all the time people are like oh come play this like afters and i'm like i don't decide what i want to do until 10 minutes when i'm done playing i'm like i may just want to go uh, home and show, so maybe you know hitting I mean? you up at the right time yeah too. if it's like a casual thing or something like that but if it's more of a yeah, if it's more of like a formal thing, it's like, okay, is this an event I want to play? Then it's dope. Let's make it happen. But that, I've, I've done things like that just through email, Instagram, DM. Wow. I'm the kind of guy that checks like every single message because I have like OCD. I need to, I'm scared of like, yeah, like some celebrity will like message me and I'll miss it. <laughs> I'll miss it. But uh, yeah, I, ch I check everything. So but some people don't. And yeah, those are the people that pr I don't know how to get a hold of them. Going back to when you took the dive full time, were your, was your family supportive? Yeah, my family was really supportive. Um, well, I wouldn't say like, they were like, oh yeah, go be a DJ, like really supportive, but they always, you know, they always trusted me and like wanted me to do like what makes me really happy. Um, and they were also like really realistic and like their, their biggest thing was like, you just should always have like a plan B, which I kind of did because I got a degree at a university, exactly. Um, so as long as I was like flexible and you know, but I, I made like a good pitch. I was like, there's no better time in my life for me to like try to do this thing full time than right now. Like I don't have a kid. Mm -hmm. I wasn't in like, you know, I wasn't like married at 23 or anything like that. Um, didn't have any like health issues that were holding me back. So I was like, let's just do this, you know? Um, for sure. What was the main goal when you took the first step? Like what did you want to accomplish in that first year? I can't really remember exactly what I wanted um, to accomplish. Like, I think every, like, DJ's goal is, like, oh, I want to play big festivals. I want to play all these shows. I want to have the best music that, like... For me, I've always had my career be very, like, linear kind of, like, steps. Mm -hmm. Like, I've never, like, been like, okay, I need to write, like, a hit song that's going to have half a billion streams in one year. Um, I'm always like, oh, that'd be sick if this DJ plays my track. Mm -hmm. If I got to play two festivals this year that'd be sick so yeah every year in like december i or in january i write like a list of goals for the year i still do it um i br kind of break it down into a category like music festivals i want to play things i want to do uh, things i want to be featured in like podcasts you want to podcast <laughs> like all this stuff like things even outside related to music and then you know i don't like look at it throughout the year but at the end of the year i'm like oh was able to do this stuff um, I know a big thing for me specifically was like once I was kind of like doing DJing full time for a few years, like the big thing that allows you to do it full time is getting an agent because um, an agent is really going to take your bookings to the next level and they have relationships with promoters that you just don't have. Um, so that was like a huge, huge goal. Was, did you have like, to pitch them in the beginning or did they start well, approaching I you? I to so many agents, but like what I realized is that and it's like most kind of like business relationships is that um, you can pitch, 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 but until the time is right where you provide value for the agency and the agency provides value for you, it's not, it's not gonna really happen, like pitching. It's not like you're gonna have a sick pitch and it's gonna work. Um, you kind of need to be like doing the thing on your own for a bit and have some success and then the agents kind of reach out to you. So when you first got an agent, they reached out to you? Yeah. Yeah. Well, kind of. I actually, like, I played a show in Nashville to my agents, this guy Logan and uh, Jay at Wasserman, but it was originally just Logan, and I played a show in Nashville, and one of my managers, Noel, knew she used to work in the agency. Um, Wasserman's one of the biggest agencies, too. Yeah, so, yeah. So it was a CAA at the time, and uh, she was like, oh, Jay, you should come see one of my artists. I didn't have an agent play the show in Nashville. Um, so he came out to the show. We kind of schmoozed it up in like the green room a bit, just like hung out and like we got along super well. Yeah. And then was yeah. it a big show? No, it was like a small show. Okay. It was like uh, yeah, it was like a little show in Nashville. Yeah. But uh, you know, I think I did a good job at the show, and he, you know, he liked 
with what he saw and the energy and then we kind of connected afterwards and yeah we've been at three different agencies actually together wow um so yeah that's my guy um, paint kick and base into the into the picture how to get started it's a unique marketing channel for you compared to other djs yeah so um so during the pandemic right when the pandemic started that was i wouldn't say like my lowest point but i wasn't like i hadn't made enough money DJing before that where I hadn't really made any money DJing. It was kind of like what we said before, like a lot of expenses, not a lot of shows, not a lot of money. Right. Um, and so I was really kind of financially like I'm fucked, like not like fucked, but I'm like, this is going to suck for a while. And the shows had to stop um, at that point. Yeah. And, and like, you know, no one really knew how long that was going to last, but I was just like, yep, all my shows got canceled for the next like two months. Yeah. Uh, what am I going to do? And I was still living at home at the time, which was lucky. But uh, I started doing private Zoom lessons. This guy, Moose, actually, he's a producer. That's his, his name's not Moose. That's his uh, production name. Um, he was like, oh, would you, like, get on Ableton or t get on Zoom with me for an hour and, like, show me some stuff on Ableton, like how you made this track or help me with this track? I was like, I've never done that, but I'll try it out. Um, and I did that, and I was like, oh, that was pretty fun. Like, I was... I felt like good at teaching kind of. And I, I was like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do more of these. I remember I put on these like glasses and like a nerdy tie and like suit. And I was, I made this like Instagram post. I was like, your tech house professor is here. It was like super corny, but it's it creative was, as fuck. It was like, dope. whatever. I was like bored at home <laughs> and uh, I got like a ton of signups, like not a ton, but it was like 25 to 30 people. Yeah. Like kind of like, we're like, Oh, we want to do these one-on-one -on -one sessions. Steady income too. Yeah. And I was like pretty cheap. I was charging like $50 an hour, which is for like an hour of like a professional's time. I wouldn't call myself a professional, but like, you know what I mean? It's yeah. like, um, and so I started doing a ton of lessons and that's like pretty much what I did the first like five months of the pandemic. And then after that, like towards 2021, the beginning, I was like getting super just burnt out with doing lessons because like you have to go on someone else's time you kind of have to it's just so much of your time suck that you have to yeah. be at a certain place and it kind of like kills your day and it kind of drains stuff. your creativity too exactly. through that music exactly that's something i'll talk about as well after when we talk about kick and bass is that when you just listen to other people's music all day it can yeah it can kind of mess with your head so i stopped doing lessons and then i was approached by this guy on instagram it was like oh i'm in this discord for uh, minimal house music. Um, I forgot, uh, I'm forgetting the guy's name, but it was basically like a music production community, but for a different genre. And he was like, you know, I love, I had a YouTube video up at the time, um, how to make tech house like one one or something like that. That was like doing pretty well. Like YouTube was kind of pushing it. And I, that was like my first tutorial video I ever made. I was just like, Oh, you know, I did all these lessons. Let me put this tutorial up. So he saw the video, he messaged me, he's like, I want to create um, a business with you where essentially we're going to make like a music production community. I'm going to kind of take what I've learned about this community I'm in and we're going to make it way better. We're going to add all these features um, and you're going to be like the head coach and we're going to build this thing together. Yeah. And so I was like, I got this message and it was like super long and I looked at it and I was like, you know, this is like kind of cool, but this is going to be, yeah, I don't know this guy's going to be so much work. And I was like very close to not doing it and just saying, no, I'm just going to keep making music and playing the few shows that I was getting at the time. Pandemic so, parties. Yeah, yeah this, is, this is a really long story. But um, yeah, so I was like, OK, like I'm just going to do this. Like essentially what I had to do is like make a ton of video content before we launch so that when the members join, um, they have all these videos ready for them to watch, like right. production tutorials. So I was like, the worst thing comes to worst, I just spent all this time making these videos and that's that. Um, but I was like, okay, let's build this business together. Let's, let's launch this community. And we launched in July of 2021. Um, I think the first day we had like 30 to 40 people sign up. And essentially what Kick and Base is, it's like a, it's a community hosted on Discord and it's like a monthly membership. So um, in order to have access to the community and to all the videos, and we offer people feedback on their tracks. At the time, it was just me. I would listen to your tracks and give you written feedback. Um, you have to pay like a monthly fee. So we had like 35 people sign up on the first day. I was like, that's so sick. Like we have 35 people that are paying whatever amount of money per month. Um, and we, we, we actually have a community now. Like we have this thing. And now we're at, I want to say like 550 wow. members. Cool. Yeah. Um, so it's grown pretty crazy. And it's kind of like my 
you know, it's my baby. It's like so much. I go to shows and people like hold kicking bass up. Yeah. I meet people like all around the world that are I'm in the, in the community. Discord. Yeah, yeah, you're in the yeah. Discord. Yeah. Um, but it's yeah, I, I realized teaching was like a huge passion of mine and like music education and like tech, the kind of combination of that was like a cool space that um, I actually enjoy doing and I, I hope to, you know, do for a while. I think a lot of DJs, they, they think that their only revenue stream is like playing shows uh, and royalties from music pretty much. Just like pennies. Just, yeah, to, to, yeah the, the royalty stuff kind of sucks and playing shows is it's just like a very single source of income so to be able to uh supplement that income and to like think as like an entrepreneur not just like i'm gonna make music and play shows but like yeah. what else can i do can i offer private lessons can i build courses and sell courses to people like i yeah. think that's a, a a market that's like not tapped into it's enough. a super interesting kind of train of thought because i feel like a lot of djs you're so right like if you stop playing shows that faucet runs out and so like not and you don't even have control over, over that because yeah. <laughs> you, you're you're not just like throwing unless you're your own you know throwing your own parties um you have to wait for people to, to book you yeah people may not want to book you. you you were about to dive into it but let's talk about palettes um when you're listening to a multitude of genres or djs that are in your scene you can get obsessed with like their sounds maybe you start trying to imitate them how what's the percentage split between listening to other people and yourself how do you like inspire a new palette or cleanse your current one? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I think, um, well, for me personally, I listen to a lot of house music. That's like, I don't listen to a lot of music. That's not like, I mean, that's not true. I do listen to other stuff, but a lot of what I listen to is, you know, like I'm on the train, like I'm trying to find new house music to play in my sets. Um, and house music now it's like, there's so many different flavors, kind of like you said, like a palette. There's this genre, and within that genre, there's like five to ten new genres, right? Um, so for me, I'm always, with my own productions, kind of taking what I'm into at the moment and trying to combine that with other styles and sounds and arrangements. Um, that's a big thing as well. Uh, so I'm never like cleaning my palette and going on to the next sound, but um, I'm always kind of like, you know, taking what I'm digging at the moment and trying to find a way to, to put my sound onto it. Um, Any weird subgenres that you got? It's, it's not really. Like, I, I, the thing is, like, I don't really, I think, I mean, honestly, like, artists at this point have, like, their own subgenre. So I have a song coming out on Friday with these guys, more from England, yeah. um, and they kind of have, like, a little sound that they do. It's, like, this arpeggiated, like, melody. So we, we kind of work together in a collaboration. Um, and I absolutely love that specific kind of, it's like, I don't know, call it melodic tech house, progressive tech house, something like that. Yeah. For the, like for the producer heads watching, for the West End sound, give us a sample pack, a synth, and a uh, rack effect. Okay. Um, a rack effect. I don't know about that, but uh, sample pack, uh, sound of Blanc, volume two. So Blanc's like a cool uh, YouTube channel and they did the sample pack. I use that one a lot. Synth, uh, I mean, it's gotta be Serum. That's just like what I use. Do you have analog say, ones in the crib or no? No, so I'm, I'm totally in the box. Like everything's on the laptop. Gotcha. I use headphones in my laptop. There's some That's old it. head cringing right now. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> is that preference or what? <laughs> it's a little bit of preference because it's just easy for me to, you know, have everything on a monitor, I don't have to. So it's part preference, it's part just like, I've never had a lot of equipment. Like growing up, you know, like I said, I, I produced in high school, then college, then my apartment, now I live in a different apartment. Like I never like built up, I never had a studio where I could be like, okay, this is, this, I can get this synth and this drum machine right, and right. blah, blah, blah. So I just like never used it. But you do but sound design in Serum? Yeah, yeah, just like all, all in the box. So either Serum or Diva, I would say, are like my preferred synths. Rack effects. Uh, I think today a lot of producers uh, don't have a lot of uh, music theory knowledge. How do you? I have like very that? very little music theory knowledge. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I can get I can get around with stuff, um, but I'm not classically trained in any in any way. I kind of struggle with like chord progressions. Oh, I mean, necessary no, but very helpful for mm -hmm. sure. A lot of like the best artists are like can kill it on the piano even if like their music isn't very like music theory heavy, like it's not very melodic in that sense. Um, 
even just like simple chord progressions, like resolving chords and things like that, like that can be super helpful. That's something that I lack and I want to get better at. And I keep telling myself, I'm like, I'm going to hire someone to give me piano lessons, to do like these music theory lessons. And I always just, just put it off. From the production standpoint, you said that you took everything like step by step, right? Like I want this DJ to play my track, things like that. Uh, you started out very like tech house and now you're kind of going more like the melodic direction. Do you think from like, is that how typical DJs should look at it? Or do you think that they could approach the mainstream from the jump or should they own a niche? I, I slightly disagree with you on that because I don't think I, I've, in my career, I've never been like step by step. Like I'm going to do this and do this and do this. I've always kind of been like, going with the flow. I meant more of just, um, you know, my career growth from an outsider's perspective has been very kind of like linear in that sense. Um, but yeah, I never think too much about genres. Like I wasn't like, oh, I'm gonna make Tech House. Like the sound that I was making kind of like evolved into that. Um, and the sound I was making got popular and called Tech House. Um, and for me, it's like, I, I'm at a point where I like to experiment a lot. so. I don't want to just be doing like one specific sound. Like I only want to do clubby party music because it's kind of like limiting as an artist to just sure. just do that. And it's like very boring in the studio. So that's why I'm kind of like with this new track um, over with more kind of branching into like more melodic stuff. But it's not like I won't still be doing like party tunes. And when you when you sit stuff. down, do you have like a sample or a melody in your head that you're going after? Or are you coming from scratch? Never. Never. Uh. Not never, but a lot of times, like, I don't know, you know, you kind of like start one sound and then that inspire you're like, oh, this would sound cool with that. And then this would sound cool with that. So it's kind of like putting together the pieces of a puzzle. Some people are probably, you know, I know people that do like voice notes on their phone where they're like mm -hmm. Charlie Puth, for example, he like, he has a whole album called, mm -hmm. I think voice notes or something like that, where it's like, maybe you're in the shower, you have like a melody and you're like, I need to get that on paper. That happens that's, to me all the time. Yeah, that's no, not, no, no, that's not how my brain works. I'm more of like, I don't start the production process until I sit down and then I'm like, are you against okay. splice for that or oh, I love splice. You love splice. splice? Cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's it. I use a lot of splice. Yeah. Dope. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, before we uh, wrap it up, quick game for you. Okay. Um, I like games. We're going to start with a year and we're going to go through a bunch of years. You got to give us the subgenre or a DJ that defined the year. So for instance, I could say like 2011, uh, yeah. Skrillex, 2012, Big Room. Um, and then for future years, what you think will come. So 2014. I like this game. It's not really a game. It's more of a question. Yeah. <laughs> 20, right, 2014. It. Oh, 2014. Um, so it's genre and DJ. It can be a subgenre or a DJ or both if you want. Future base, I would say. Yeah, 2014. 2014. 2015. Oh, future house. So like, or I'll say Chami. Or Oliver Heldens. 2015? Yeah. Okay, 2016. I think so, yeah. This is where it gets. Summer 16. Is, I'm gonna say. Can I say a label? Like Dirty Bird. I'm gonna say. Nice. 17. It's like weird, wonky house. 2017. I, I wanna say, like, th for, for me, this is like what I was into was Dirty Bird at the time. So I'll say Box of Cats. Box. Have you heard yeah. of that? Yeah, that was that was one of your first releases, Kyle right? Kyle Watson. Yeah, I, I released yeah. them. It was Kyle Watson and Wongo's label and a couple other guys too. Okay, eighteen when you first got in the scene, kind of. Twenty eighteen, Fisher. Fisher, really? Yeah, that's like when Fisher started. So like he wasn't mainstream popular at all, but for the the house people at the time, is that when the like, was, was released? Yeah, like, like, oh yeah, that was. Definitely. I'm pretty sure that was twenty eighteen. I may be wrong, I'd be 2019, but I'm gonna say yeah. Fisher for that. Who would you do in an older year, like, or not super old, but like uh, 2009, let's say? 2009 is definitely for me like Blog House. So, kind of like Bloody Beat Roots, Justice, Crookers, um, that kind of like w fidget house is like another term for yeah. that. Yeah. 2023? 2023. We're in 2023 right now. I was like, wait, what year is it? <laughs> um, I'll say like progressive tech house. Progressive tech house. Yeah. Okay. Kind of like it's the, like the where you are, John, John Simmons. Yeah, song. a little yeah. bit like that sound. So where are we in 2025? 2025, we're going to skip 2024. Go for, go for 2024, sure. Uh, I think 2024, we're definitely in techno, techno. I think. Huh. I mean, we could say 2023 yeah. is techno too. 2025, I don't know. Maybe drum and bass. 
Drum and bass would be dope if Dubs that game. came back <laughs> super hard. Yeah. Honestly, drum and bass is making every resurgence. Yeah. yeah, maybe twenty twenty. I'll say twenty twenty four drum and bass. Like more melodic light drum and bass, or are we going super like grimy UK? Uh, I would say like grimy UK getting popular in America, maybe. Yeah. If I had to read a Magic Eight Ball, twenty twenty five. I have no idea. Okay, so then don't I have punch a few, you. Few final like speed round questions. All right. Okay. Number one. What's the biggest or just one major piece of advice you'd give to an early artist, first year artist? Post a lot of bootlegs on SoundCloud. A lot of bootlegs on SoundCloud. Yeah. What's one piece of advice you'd give yourself five years ago that you wish you knew then? Trust the process and work hard. For sure. And then the final one is what's, what's next for you? What are you most excited about this year? So I'm going to be launching my label in... Uh, either August or September, the first track will come out, but um, I'm, I've been working on this really hard over the last few months, so everything this year has kind of, kind of been leading up to that moment, and there's gonna be a big tour um, all across the US that's that's tied to the label as well, so yeah, that's, I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. That's kind of like the biggest thing that's on my mind, and you know, just having that grow into next year and, and beyond. Awesome. We'll be listening. Thank you for, for coming on. Thank today you, man. Sharing your story. Awesome, bro. Cheers. Thanks so much. Do it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Dope.